Good evening, everyone. My name is Ruchika Mudwani. It is a great pleasure to be here this evening to welcome you all on behalf of Plosico to the wonderful webinar, which is going to be conducted by veteran and dynamic advocate, Mr. Tanvir Ahmed Meer. But before uh, I let uh, Tanvir sir take over the webinar, I would like to give a brief introduction about him. Though he absolutely needs no introduction, but, but I would definitely want to highlight his uh, few achievements. Mr. Tanvi Sir uh, is a known veteran criminal litigation advocate. He has experience of over 21 years. Mr. Meer is founder, founder partner at Lex Alliance. He has successfully defended the accused in various cases, namely 2G Spectrum, Arushi Talwar, Hemraj Double Murder, Ryan School Murder, August Westland, Mr. Gurmeet Ram Rahim and Rahim, Mr. Rahim's organization, Terra Sacha Soda. Mr. Mihir has also defended corporate lobbyist Mr. Deepak Talwar and Mr. Robert Vadra and his associates in corruption and money laundering cases. Sir is also a counsel for Injani Peter Mukherjee in Sheena Bora murder case and Nargis Juneja murder case. Um, that's about it. Thank you so much, sir, for giving us your precious time and agreeing to do this webinar. It's a privilege to have you here. And I would especially like to thank Abhishek for making this happen. Uh, I'm sure Abhishek is here with us right now. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for agreeing to this. And uh, now uh, may I let you take, take over the webinar? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Ruchika, for... Uh, inviting me over and I would like to uh, uh, commend the uh, persuasiveness of uh, Abhishek. Uh, I, I didn't know him before. He's a student. So he was after me to uh, agree to speak on uh, how to conduct a murder trial. And okay. since it's students approaching me, so I yeah. decided to do it pro bono. And of course, I believe there are a number of law students on your platform and lawyers as well. So yes. I'm under a duty and obligation to share my experience of handling a serious crime for the last 21 years as a defense counsel and mostly as a trial and cross-examining lawyer so that at the end of this discussion, I can you know, have an interaction and answer the questions of all my friends who are on this platform. That's the most important aspect of it. Now, uh, before I begin on uh, how uh, I look at a murder trial being a defense counsel, I would also like, you know, all the participants that uh, they can ask me any question, even beyond the subject that I would be talking about today. They can ask me subject about general practice, saturation in legal profession, practice, progress, advancement, what kind of money lawyers can make and how far they can go. You know, is it really a difficult profession to set on, settle on? Do we really need links? Do we need financial ba family backgrounds in law? Or can a person who has no background also rise to the occasion and contribute? These are very important aspects. We can also talk about some other things. What happened in courts? What happens in Supreme Court? And some ancillary issues around the topic. So I would love to answer uh, a lot of questions as and when they are asked. Now, uh, so I must say that, uh, you know, uh, I've uh, spent around 21 years in dedicated crime serious practice. And mostly uh, I have been operating out of the district courts in Delhi, but also uh, the district courts and high courts in many parts of India. You have also uh, thankfully given the background of some of the cases where I have worked as defense counsel. And all these cases are very important to every lawyer, to me as a defense counsel. Some of the, the, the cases are remembered. Some of the cases may not be remembered, but the lawyer has to you know, have an equal uh, stimulation and interest in each and every client that he defends in a court of law. It's not that because I am the defense counsel in Arushi Talwar, Hemraj double murders. So I'll give more attention to that case than a somebody who would not be, you know, that, you know, media highlighted or be in the limelight. That's a fundamental aspect. Now, coming back to the topic in hand as to how to handle a murder trial. So 
uh, I would begin with some basics here. So murder all over the world is uh, the most serious crime. You know, there cannot be a, a criminal offense beyond murder as ghastly as it is to take somebody's life. And therefore, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, punishment is under section 302. If convicted, your client can get a death sentence or minimum a life sentence if he doesn't get acquitted. Therefore, the law statutorily prescribes that when an offense gets as serious as murder, it is to be tried by a senior court. Now, in, in the court system in India, we have two systems of courts. One is a magisterial court, uh, what you call as JMIC in states or metropolitan magistrate in the metropolitan areas. And the sessions courts, which you call as, you know, an ASJ in Delhi or a special or a special judge or a sessions judge in the states. So law prescribes that a murder trial shall always be before a court of session and not before a court of magistrate. And it also prescribes, the Court of Criminal Procedure says that since murder is a very, very serious offense, therefore the investigating authority, be it the police or any specialized agency like CBI, the minimum rank of a person who can be an investigating case, officer in a murder case is minimum of the rank of inspector. So you cannot have a sub-inspector as an investigating officer of a murder case. A sub-inspector can certainly be an investigating officer, say, for example, in a case of cheating, aggravated cheating, criminal breach of trust, aggravated breach of trust, forgery of documents, aggravated forgery, and other offenses. First and foremost, any lawyer who looks forward to uh, do a challenging task of defending a murder accused has to first contend with himself that A, do I have in it myself? Am I ready for this mental, this challenge, mental, physical, or otherwise, to defend somebody who's accused of murdering somebody? So that one doesn't walk into a court of law or defending somebody with any amount of emotional baggage. It's very important for a lawyer that when he steps his foot in a court of law or is engaged by a client, he has to give 100% believe in the innocence of his client and then take up the assignment. The first and foremost is that you cannot walk into a murder trial with some amount of preconceived emotional baggage on your shoulders or preconceived notions. You have to think like with your client that my client is innocent. The allegations which are against him are false and I will prove it before a court of law. This is the zest with which you have to walk, you have to take the brief, and that is your moral and professional obligation that I'll do best for my client while taking up his defense and taking it to a logical conclusion. First and foremost is that when any person is, you know, involved, indicted in a murder case, there are two steps. First is, there is some FIR which is lodged, so a person may be named in the FIR, may not be named in the FIR. Somebody may get involved or indicted in a murder case during the course of investigation. If a lawyer is engaged by his client during the course of investigation, that's a very good thing because then you are a lawyer right from the beginning. So if you are engaged after the investigation is completed, somebody is charge sheeted by the police, charge sheet is filed before a magistrate, it gets committed to a court of session and the trial begins, you come into the case at that point of time, fair enough. It is always better both for the client and for the defense lawyer to be in the case as early as it comes. Because if you join later, then sometimes you are run into a situation where too much of damage is already done. So if you are engaged at the time when investigation is on, you have a detailed discussion with your client. That's very foremost. Foremost important is have an interaction with your client. Now, most of the time, you know, uh, there will hardly be any cases less than 1%, at least in India, where a person is indicted in murder, but yet not arrested. So if a person is arrested, you will file his vakalat nama, you will seek the permission to go to a jail or correctional facility and have a meeting with your client and take an actual lowdown from him as to what he has to say. 
how things have happened, what is the factual narrative, what is the suspicion against him, what are the circumstances, and how exactly he is responding to your queries and the factual narrative. We must make it's very important that you always make notes of little things, you know, which the client says. You never know what importance it will append to. If Secondly is that the, if you are there right at the stage of FIR or investigation is after you have this interaction with your client, the first thing you do is try and make a site visit. Say, for example, if the murder is, has happened, say, inside a residential area, for example, you know, let's take, I'll also resort to some examples of the cases that I have handled and one which would sort of interest and intrigue most of my friends today on the platform would be Arushi Talwar Hemraj's double murders, where, you know, I was the defense lawyer in the trial and also the lawyer who argued the appeal along with some of my colleagues out of Allahabad High Court. So first thing I did is, or you should do, is go for a site visit. Take uh, photographs. If you have a video camera, take a picture of the whole area so that you can have a detailed study later on your laptops, on your desktops, that what all is in the situation, what has happened, what is being, you know, uh, what a person is being accused of, and what kind of evidence is available on the site. That's very, very important for you. So please go for a site visit. Now, sometimes, you know, the murder will be on some lay road man. Sometimes it will be in a residential area. Sometimes it will be in a vehicle. Somebody, sometimes it will be in a forest. Sometimes it will be near a river. So you can always go to, sometimes it will be at a place where you, the, finally the body is found. I would recommend and suggest that even if it is a Nala, one must see, you know, the whole Nala and then, you know, make a picture of it. You know, sometimes even calculate distances. What is the importance of this activity comes during the course of the trial? For example, it is very necessary for the investigating authorities and often we see it on all criminal cases that they always make site plans. So site plans usually if now the hazard with police officers is, which we find is that most of the time the police officers do not, you know, do their police investigation on the stop on the spot, but they do it, you know, virtually in police stations. So sometimes yeah. there, or I say most of the time I find that their site plans are incorrect. Now, if you have gone for a site visit, you will find that there is a difference between the site plan which the police officers are relying upon and there is a difference in the site plan or the site which you have seen. So you would already have some tools in your hand on the basis of which you can rebut the allegations and contest the case. So site visit is very important for any, you know, it's, it, this is not a case of cheating. You know, this is not a case of bank fraud. This is a case of murder. Somebody has been murdered. So somebody obviously will be murdered at a particular place. In Arushi Talwar, Hemrad's double murders, a strange scenario, you know, uh, emanated. One dead body is on the roof, uh, on the bed in a room, and one dead body is on the roof. So lest you see the roof, lest you see the room, lest you see the stairs, lest you see the apartment, lest you see the dimensions, you will not be able to get a grip on what is being presented and what is the reality. So the idea of the site visit, pictures, notes, and uh, videographs are very important. Sometimes it is also essential that where, you know, the finances put in by the client are not a problem. So you can take an expert, some, someone who's an expert, like a draftsman, there are a lot of people, you know, you can always find them on the net. Some people, you know, who were draftsmen with the government in various departments who worked for the prosecution earlier are now to available to work with defense. Sometimes there are some people who are crime scene reconstructors and they're also available to help you. If the clients do not have problem with finances, you can take these experts and take their help in having an actual scenario of the situs of the crime. And later you can reap the benefits of the work that you do. Now, most of our lawyers, what we do is we get a charge sheet, read and start, but we forget these activities. If we do these activities as a defense lawyer, 
we have we are very well prepared you are ahead of the prosecutor you are little ahead of the investigating officer and he does not know what cards you have and ultimately you have better cards than him next point is that after the investigation is over the police investigation is not known to you as a defense lawyer even the accused doesn't know but accused can tell you sometimes he can tell you an alibi the alibi may be false the alibi may be correct so the job of the defense lawyer now again becomes in interviewing all those people who are close to the accused if he presents an alibi you introspect on the alibi and do your homework so the client the, the client may send the persons to you or you may go and meet them again you meet the persons let it not be an oral interaction only you make your notes you take notes of important aspects in regard of the alibi or circumstances you can talk about people you can even sometimes you know have a chat chat with next door neighbors now for example i'll tell you when i was doing arushi talwar himraj double murders i happened to talk to some of the neighbors and incidentally some of the neighbors said sir strangely we never heard any noise in the night two persons got murdered but there was an eerie silence and we never heard anything there was no noise there was complete absurdity so i had a i had made a note of this in my diary and later i found that it was of great importance when i had to contest the case in the trial at ghaziabad district courts second point is that the moment charge sheet is filed the real work of a defense lawyer starts because the charge sheet now tells a defense lawyer that this is the evidence which will be led by the prosecution against your client in order to earn a conviction and that's the evidence which you have to rebut that's the evidence in which you have to create a doubt the evidence in a murder case now let's come into what kind of evidence can come in a murder trial in a murder trial you can have three kinds of evidences one kinds of evidence will be purely circumstantial which means nobody saw the murder nobody heard anything and nobody is able to give a first hand account so we'll go to the court and say your honor this is a case purely of circumstantial evidence and nothing else sometimes you have a case where there is an ocular account somebody saw so somebody is holding an eyewitness account the moment an eyewitness account comes in the trouble for the defense lawyer increases because now there are two propositions for a person who saw the murder ultimately he becomes the most important witness so in order to earn an acquittal you now have to prove that a this person's statement or his ocular testimony may not be that trustworthy at all so in order to earn an acquittal in a case of ocular testimony the burden moves higher the work moves higher and you also now to need to consult to convince your trial judge that the statement of the ocular witness or a person who is holding an eye witness account is clearly doubtful so you will have to study about that eye witness account holder a lot you'll have to see sometimes it's also important again in a case where finances are not a problem to even engage detectives where you can say that is this person really there what is his background how far he is trustworthy how far he is not trustworthy what kind of background of a person he is was he really there is he a trumped up witness because many a time we see that there is a murder and there is a huge complaint there is a big complainant party influential or otherwise they tend to you know have introduced two or three persons ke ha ji dekho ji maine to khud apni aankhon se dekh liya this is a good tendency many a time trial lawyers see that there are trumped up eye witness account holders but when you do an analysis about them you find that these are trumped up eye witnesses so therefore the work on the witnesses increases the third kind of evidence which comes in a murder case from the prosecution side is partly circumstantial partly ocular testimony now the moment if a person for example is contended with a murder case where it's a case of pure circumstantial evidence then those circumstances and the kind of witnesses and documentary evidence 
that is presented presents a huge challenge to the defense council to study them one by one but first of all all lawyers walking into any case a murder case cheating case you must also simultaneously be very well versed with the judgments that cover the core fields for example when we deal with a case of circumstantial evidence we must be aware as to how the court of law finally appreciates a case of circumstantial evidence so you have some fascinating judgments coming from supreme court high court or all over the world for example a basic judgment is wadala pira radi and you come across that panchil five doctrines in a case of circumstantial evidence where they say that the each circumstance against an accused must be proved by the prosecution beyond reasonable doubt the circumstances then should be connected to make such an unbreakable chain that there is no hypothesis of the murder being committed by the accused facing the trial except the hypothesis pressed by the prosecution and there is no alternative hypothesis there and then the job of the defense counsel arises in a case of circumstantial evidence there are two objectives to be achieved one is an attempt to break the case of the prosecution of the circumstances identified on the basis of evidence being proved on its individual strength beyond reasonable doubt for example one of the circumstances in a practical case can be let's talk about arushi talwar hemraj double murders is say there is an allegation that sir there is an internet router present in the room of the daughter which when accessed by experts at the service provider that is airtel company has produced a log that log shows continuous in internet activity throughout the night and therefore the cbi prosecutors say sir there is consumption of internet all over the night and it seems that there are some breakages so they consult some experts who come up with this theory that the inhabitants of the house have been switching on and switching off the router of the internet physically all over the night but when the inhabitants of the house that is the talwar doctor couple when they are interrogated by the investigating authorities they say sir we were asleep and we were not you know up alive and kicking in the night so a circumstance comes up that whether the inhabitants were asleep or whether the inter inhabitants were up alive and kicking now this is a circumstance which is one of the other most other say about 14 to 15 circumstances which will emanate in almost all the murder cases the circumstances may differ one of the circumstances can be sir whether this is the murder weapon so if it's a neck slit prosecution says it's a doctor scalpel so that circumstance the prosecution is under an obligation to prove beyond reasonable doubt so the defense counsel's work comes into play that your honor this is not a circumstance which is proved by the prosecution on account of following reasons now these following reasons are where this is not in grounds of appeal how do you tomorrow argue before a trial court after the evidence is all led that these circumstances are not proved how will you prove them it's not that you will draw your grounds or reasons it is the evidence that will be recorded so you have to cross examine those witnesses in a manner that from that cross examination you will be able to rely upon and read those admissions on the basis of which tomorrow at the stage of final argument you can contend that this circumstance is not proved thereby breaking the chain thirdly once you have identified all those circumstances you have to work on each for example weapon if it's a gunshot then you have to see that whether this gunshot the ballistics report is correct whether it is doubtful so the forensics comes into play important aspects in any murder trial will be 
that a the person has has been murdered this is a fact how this has this person has been murdered is what the prosecution alleges for example if the prosecution alleges it's a neck chop but they may say it's a weapon a if you are able to show in the trial that it's a weapon b there goes the prosecution case a doubt is introduced and your client walks out of the indictment thirdly is the combination of all these circumstances finally should be able to convince a trial judge that prosecution has not been able to prove its case entirely they may have proved two circumstances but they have failed to prove about six circumstances or seven circumstances and that's where you go important aspects further remain is that once you study this evidence so evidence will come to you documentary evidence will come to you oral so there may be witnesses of particular circumstances so you will be up there for their cross examination cross examination is the most important tool for any litigation lawyer be it a civil lawyer be it a criminal lawyer be it a company lawyer or some other all lawyers who are in litigation so lest you are deft in the art of cross examination do not do litigation at all so my advice is what i tell my younger colleagues is that if you want to be a litigator for first 7 years of your law of your life you should spend your time in trial courts alone because that's where you see how evidence is led how evidence is broken how circumstances are shattered how you do a cross examination how you prepare but today we have lesser time i will try to you know zoom in everything into your repertoire of handling a trial tomorrow whenever you are ready and you know contended with a proposition of cross examining a witness you have three four more tools number one is please first go through his all prior statements recorded by the police or given elsewhere for example in nirbhaya case the boy who survived gave a video interview now the lawyers went up to high court up to supreme court that here is something called as a fatal contradiction first of all when you attempt to break a witness in the case of circumstantial evidence or otherwise first tool in your hand is see whether you can introduce contradictions by the means of cross examination in the testimony of the witness therefore first all you friends must be well aware where what is the law of contradiction sometimes people say oh contradiction is like you know you say this thing here but you say that thing there no 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 every criminal lawyer is duty bound now i am not asking this question today you will ask me questions later otherwise i would ask this question right now that all of you lawyers at least give me that which is the most important judgment passed by the supreme court ever defining what is contradiction in any kind of cross examination so if you don't know it if you know it very well if you don't know it please make a note it's a constitutional bench judgment coming from supreme court called tehsildar singh versus state and it emanated from honorable anabad high court so tehsildar is an encyclopedia it's an epitome it's the bible for a cross examining lawyer if you don't know tehsildar and if you don't read it and don't read it once read it at least 20 times to understand what tehsildar is all about it's also called as the famous lantern case so tehsildar has a humongous history and it emanated out of a fluke one day in a murder trial somewhere in uttar pradesh a young cross examining lawyer probably early in his life happened to ask a question to a witness that you know you just stated in your examination in chief that when in the village party was going on there was light of the lantern what we in hindi language called as lantern but when you recorded your police statement what statement we generally call as 
a statement recorded under 161 of CRPC, you not refer to this Laltain at all. So the judge stopped him. He said, Mr. Counsel, why are you asking this question? And uh, he said, sir, I want to contradict. He, so the judge asked him, do you know what is the law of contradiction? So he said, sir, he's just said something which he has not said, you know, in his 161. He said, sorry, that is an omission. So an omission is not a contradiction. So the, the lawyer then started arguing, sir, how, how can that be? He said, well, please go and read. This Tessildar Singh is a case which happened prior to incorporation of CRPC 1973. If you now read sections 161 and 162, its language is encompassed and called into play directly from the judgment of Tessildar Singh. So the Honorable Judge Sessions judge was so live, so vibrant. He said, well, this is a very important issue. The young lawyer is racing, is, 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 is you know, uh, breaking up for the consideration of the court. And on this, I think we should have guidance from the High Court. So the Sessions judge makes a reference to Honorable Allahabad High Court, which is made under 395 of CRPC. The reference is sent to Allahabad High Court. There is a strange situation, Your Honours. My lords are very it that this is a statement recorded under 161. Here is a witness giving something and he mentions there, which he is not mentioned earlier. Can it be a contradiction? One judge writes the judgment and he thinks that, look here, there is an amiss. We should have a full bench. So Honorable Halabad High Court encompasses a full bench to decide what a contradiction is. And a full bench is passed, which is taken by state of UP to Honorable Supreme Court of India. And in the Supreme Court, the matter is deliberated. And finally, you have Tessildar Singh, which is the final say on what a contradiction is all about. And law on contradictions remains. For a criminal trial lawyer, cross-examining a witness in murder case or otherwise, anything that the witness says, which is beyond his 161, is finally to be expunged by the trial judge from the zone of consideration while deciding the case, lest the contradiction is superficial or if it is material. See, this superficial and material is again development of law. The earliest Tessildar says that if you made a statement which is contrary to your statement in 161, then that part of your testimony will be read out. That is still the law. The law further has developed where the Supreme Court judges said, my read circumstances, poor country, less police paraphernalia. So if it's a contradiction which goes to the root of the matter, then that part of the testimony shall be read out. First tool in the hand of, therefore, a cross-examining lawyer is to discredit the witness on the basis of introducing contradictions. Now, whether a contradiction will be material or not is left finally to the fate of the case and the wisdom of the judge in a specific factual narrative in which the case presents itself. Let me now relate this very important aspect of conducting a murder trial with an example in hand. Let's go back to Arushi Talwar Hemraj double murders. So very important aspect of contradiction arose. The first person on 16th of May 2008 to visit the apartment was, you know, a daily maid called Bharti Mandal. She testified in the case. She had three 161 statements, one recorded by Noida police, two recorded by CBI. Here she comes into the court and gives a statement. In the statement, you know, she talks about a lot of things here and there, which are not a part of her previous statements at all. Finally, in the cross exam, she enters into cross examination. We ask her questions, we ask her questions. And finally, she says that, look, whatever has been taught to me, I have stated in the court. So, Hindi me bolenge, do gawane adalat me bola, dekhiye, mujhe jo sikhaya gaya hai, vhi bayan mene adalat me diya that, you know, once it came in the testimony, I thought that, you know, fine, there is no 
nothing more need, needs to be asked. Thank you very much. Let's go home. When it came to the trial judge, he had none of it. So he would say that, look, hey, this witness comes from a very, very, you know, uh, marginalized says, you know, uh, sector of the society. She's a person who has come from Malda district of West Bengal to work as a maid somewhere in NCT Delhi. So even if she has said this, this doesn't move me. But there were two to three fatal contradictions in her testimony. For example, she said in her chief, she said, look here, when I press the bill, sometimes pressing, we press bills on a daily basis, but sometimes on pressing of a bill, somebody may get a death penalty or somebody, you know, may get acquitted. That's the beauty of a cross-examining lawyer and the legal practice. So she says, I press the bill, then I touch the door. And uh, I press the bell again. And I was looking from the outermost door, which is a mesh door. And there is a third door where the lady opened and I started to have a conversation with her. Now I contradicted her in the cross examination that when you recorded your statement with the first investigating officer, did you say that I pressed the bell and put my hand on the door? So she said, I don't remember. So I said, fine, let's go through your statement. So the whole statement was read out to her and it was recorded that this portion is not a part of her first statement. This portion is not a part of her second statement. And this portion is not a part of her third statement. That we saw it came on record. Now the testimony is locked. Police statements are there and we are before a final argument. Evidence is closed. So what do we have in hand as a, uh, as a cross-examining lawyer or now an arguing counsel? So prosecutor will say, sir, look, this lady pressed a button, pressed her hand on the door. The door did not open, which means the door was bolted from inside. If the door was bolted from inside, then the murderers have to be people who are inside the apartment alone. Then outsiders did not commit the murder. No, if no outsider came, then who can be the murderers? Then the inhabitants alone. Well, I said, well, well, this seems to be some kind of a big scud missile on my head. So I said, sorry, Your Honor, I would like to rely, place complete comprehensive reliance upon Tessildar Singh. But I said, Mr. Meet, Tessildar Singh, I have read many times. What will you get out of it? I said, nothing doing, Your Honor. Let's read it again. We read it once, twice, thrice. I said, now please see this testimony. The fact that she introduces this hand on door theory for the first time in her testimony when she comes and takes an oath and records a statement has great relevance and is material to the whole case. The judge says, why, Mr. Meir? I say, Your Honor, because it's from here that the learned prosecutor seeks to argue that the murderers are my clients and nobody else. Therefore, this has a great significance and it's a material improvement. It's a material contradiction which will go to the root of the matter in the factual narrative of the case. So the judge says, well, I'll think about it. When the trial court verdict comes, I get a life sentence for both my clients. Okay, one doesn't lose heart. You know, we go on fighting, we go to high court. High court, we argue for four months and this aspect is argued for four days. So as a cross-examining lawyer or a high court lawyer or any lawyer who's arguing the case, and let me tell you, the best lawyer to argue the case is always your trial lawyer, nobody else, because nobody knows the case more than the trial lawyer. So let me tell you, all my friends, that this aspect of hand on door in Arushi Talwar Hemraj was argued for four continuous days in Allahabad High Court, amongst reading nothing less than more than one dozen judgments. That's the importance of contradiction as a tool in your hand to break a witness, to create a contradiction of which you can derive a mileage at the stage of your final arguments. Remember a criminal trial lawyer does two things fundamentally. One is that he's very well versed in the law that he reads, that he practices. So I must be able I must be aware that what is the law of contradiction? And if I introduce a contradiction, how I will relate that contradiction to the prevalent law or the judgment of the Supreme Court 
and presented it in a manner before the court where the court is convinced that on account of this contradiction, the witness cannot be believed at all. And counter will be the task of the prosecutor because he will be at you all the time that this is proved. And let me tell you, there is a proposition which the judges write that prosecution is not under an obligation to prove its case on mathematical propositions. Well, let me tell you as a defense lawyer, even the defense lawyer is not to prove his case on mathematical precision. If there is no mathematical precision for the prosecutor, it ain't or not me. Now a burden mere aap pe, mere pe hai na aap pe hoga when you will handle a murder trial by the grace of God in ahead of your time with a plum and with some amount of authority. Remember these things. So contradiction, very important too. Study of witness, very important. What, what is this witness? Where does he come from? Is he speaking the truth? So sometimes we also have to say, if our client says that, sir, according to me, the presence of this witness is very doubtful at a place where he says. Now, these kinds of activities, you know, you have to do, you have also to keep, you know, a great sense of timelines. For example, if there is a situation where a witness says that I was at place A at a particular period of time, you have your tools to decide and to get to know whether his position is correct. So you may say that, let me access his phone calls. Let me access his detailed records. Let me have a look at his call chart towers, whether he's there or not. These can be done in two ways. Either one can have a detective and he can get you this. Or if you're very sure, then you can file an application in a court of law. Sir, I want this gentleman's call records frozen. Because what will happen is, according to DOT guidelines, all call records in India get evaporated after one year. So you have to be very vigilant when you see in a murder case, you will have the charge sheet in three months time. If a person is in custody, you will be able to understand what kind of evidence is up against me and what kind of defense I need. So to break a witness, you can have the tool of cross-examination. In the cross-examination, most important contradiction. Number two, situs of witness. Third is his denim. When you cross-examine, you must know what to ask that witness and what not to ask. One last important aspect of cross-examination is very important, which sometimes we forget. You know what your defense is. So you are under an obligation to put your defense to each of the witnesses by the means of suggestions. So you will say to, to a witness you who says for you, for who you have a defense that look here, you're a liar. You are claiming to yourself to be in defense colony Delhi at nine o'clock on say 1st of January, 2018, but actually you're not there. If you don't give this suggestion to the witness, you're nowhere in the trial. So importance of giving suggestions specifically to the most important witness, very important. You also need to categorize your defects. Categorize means that you have to see that in a case of circumstantial evidence, ocular testimony, what is the kind of evidence that has come? So some witnesses will be oral testimony. Some witnesses will be totally forensic evidence. So you have to prepare for each and every forensic evidence, each and every oral testimony. Coming, let's now come to forensic evidence is always an important aspect of a murder trial. So forensic evidence, what a forensic looks for. A, if it's a case of neck slit, bullet shot, gunshot injury, hammer, head injury, you will see the situs. So you will see cops, usually crime scene teams, you know, collecting what you call as, you know, blood soaked earth samples, rock samples, you know, uh, sometimes shoe prints, sometimes hand prints, sometimes fingerprints. And sometimes, you know, uh, when they catch the accused, there will be a, a, you know, a very strong search of any directly indicating connecting evidence. For example, if the blood of the deceased is on, the clothes of the accused will consider yourself 90% gone. Not that you have not much left, but still there is scope because then the burden increases. 
So you have to prepare for each evidence. Now, if there is a DNA expert, now you must remember that DNA, uh, DNA evidence is extremely highly scientific. And while this, you must, you know, understand the semantics, the study of DNA, but it's best advised that while there is a prosecution expert coming to prove DNA, DNA usually comes in two terms. You will see DNA regularly in rape cases. Sexual assault cases largely dependent upon DNA. Murder cases, yes, DNA, if you can find it. So important aspect is that if there is a prosecution expert, get your expert in defense prepared well in advance. Never risk your client in trying to depend upon your ability of cross-examination with an expert alone, taking him into the stage of final argument. On this proposition also, I'll share a live case with you. One of the cases best, which can be exemplified, is the famous Priya Darshani Mattu murder case, if you would have ever heard about it. It was a, one of the two fundamental cases which, you know, arose uh, or gave rise to media in, implosions in criminal trials in Delhi, were Jessica Lal murder case and Priya Darshani Mattu murder case. Priya Darshani Mattu murder case there was a very, very famous defense lawyer out of trial courts of India called Pandit Naseem Saab. R.K. Naseem. Naseem Unka Takhalus Tha. He was a poet as well. Very, very famous. One of the top most criminal trial lawyers of his time. So in Priya Darshani Matu, the accused was himself a lawyer. His father was a very highly ranked cop. So he had the best trial lawyer defending him. Incidentally, today, the person who is speaking before you was a friend of Priya Darshini, and I was the only prosecution witness in that case from Delhi University. That case is close to me. But I'll tell you something on fallacy of lawyering in DNA. That's my objective. So Naseem Saab, what he did in Priya Darshini Matu is, we had a very famous prosecution expert coming from CDFD Hyderabad, which is one of the best DNA laboratories in India. He was one Dr. Rao. So Pandit Naseem Saab said that I will take this Dr. Rao to cleaners. No problem. So he started studying DNA. This is what my colleagues tell me, although he cross-examined me. And let me tell you for first 10 minutes, I was almost, you know, uh, shaking in my knees. But after that 10 minutes, I turned the heat on his head. I testified in Priya Darshani Mattu as prosecution witness number 10. So Pandit Naseem Saab cross-examined Dr. Rao. I think he to his own self, he did a wonderful job. No issues. GP Thareja was the trial judge. And GP Thareja was the trial judge in Tandoor Kand. Sushil Sharma Tandoor Kand. That when he chopped his wife and, you know, put that in a Tandoor and uh, a hotel in Pranat Place and set it on fire. So same GP Thareja. GP Thareja acquitted Santosh Singh. CBI took the appeal to Honorable Delhi High Court. I witnessed that appeal having more than a personal interest in the case, being a prosecution witness. Also, to live up to my friend who was raped and murdered. So, uh, the division bench which was hearing the case, so um, Pandit Naseem Saab, uh, uh, God give him heaven, he was a wonderful lawyer. He's, uh, he lives no more. So, R.S. Sodi, Justice R.S. Sodi, famous Justice R.S. Sodi, was leading the DB, and he asked Mr. Naseem, uh, Naseem Saab, please tell the court, do you claim yourself to have an expertise of the level of Dr. Rao in DNA evidence? Naseem Saab said, sorry, Your Honor. Next question. Naseem Saab, please tell us what prevented you from getting a DNA expert in defense? Uh, Your Honor, uh, my Lord, I thought that I did a wonderful job myself. Okay. Thank you very much. Case is rejected. So remember, in a forensic evidence, if you have to be contended with Speciality forensic evidence, for example, voice. Voice is now a very huge thing in criminal trials because most of us are under surveillance. I am already under surveillance, let me tell you. So uh, tomorrow you will see a lot of CBI indictments where voice is in evidence and you have your voice has been tapped. Tomorrow somebody is arrested and first of all, the investigating authority takes his voice. Sample. So there goes Santosh Singh. The DNA evidence brought by the prosecution was upheld. 
cross examination was not in any way there up to the mark to break the testimony resulting in an acquittal getting converted into a conviction and on the sentence let me tell you the division bench gave a death penalty to the accused in priyadarshini matu the supreme court scaled the death penalty to a life sentence so my friends when you are contended with speciality forensic evidence make it a point that you have your expert in defense ahead of time so the moment you get a charge sheet you will get the basics of forensic evidence if it's a dna you will get electrophorograms you will study you will consult your expert then your expert will advise you as to how he intends to break down the dna evidence so then you will get that expert in defense to testify let's go to another connecting example and i will terminate the dna part of it in arushi talwar i wanted a dna expert because there was a, a dna expert from prosecution called one mr prasad and there was a, a valentines whisky bottle valentines finest scotch the prosecution said sir on this valentines scotch we have identified mixed partial profiles not full blooded profiles and the partial profiles are both of deceased arushi and deceased hemrat well you evidence for you thank you very much what to do and it has some minor blood spots but there were also five five fingerprints and and fantastically none of them matched with either of the pins but prosecution charge was that there is a mixed partial profile i as a defense counsel wanted to say that prosecution expert is a duffer sorry for using the word that he has no concept of dna but how did i come to know it so i consulted a dna expert out of england and i said that sir will you be willing to testify in an indian court he said i love it i said no issues so when it came to my turn of adducing defense i filed an application before my famous judge called shamlal in ghaziabad also very funnily called as sazala the man had never acquitted anybody so he said mr meer i will not allow you to have a defense expert at all thank you very much you can go wherever you have to go i said very well your honor i took the matter to high court i said my lord i am facing a double murder charge and the trial court is saying me that you can't have a defense expert and he is not even willing to share the databases of dna evidence with me so high court had none of it although there was a five day argument i remember before justice sudhir agarwal a very famous judge and let me tell you gentlemen and ladies justice sudhir agarwal was one of the judges in the three judges ayodhya judgment coming from alabad which was challenged in supreme court so a fantastic judge he allowed all my petitions and i got an expert from england to testify in a court in ghaziabad where if you sit your pants next day are in tatters because the 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 seats are all broken and it have nails coming out baithe aadmi ki patloon phad jati that's the kind of infrastructure but i tell you in all these court, courts work is done so in comes dr andre semikhodsky an expert out of england who testifies for both prosecution and defense so he said to the court so judge was very puzzled to see a british expert coming in a murder trial in india he said how do you intend so after you know he adduced i you know we sat on the testimony and i drafted it and how you have to present yourself in an indian court he did very well so he the judge then uh, you know sort of since he was a foreign expert the judge called us for a cup of tea in his chambers so uh, he asked him a question that dr semikonski what do you think about this indian expert so he said that sir if he comes and testifies in england he will lose his license and that's the way i was able to rebut the entire testimony of a prosecution dna expert so my younger friends remember when it comes to forensic evidence dna ballistics handwriting biological fluid crime scene reconstruction anything be prepared to discuss it with your client to have a defense expert sometimes a defense expert is not that costly you know sometimes a defense expert will say all right i will charge you 30000 rupees most of the clients can afford unless and until it's not you know a pro bono brief from jail where you have limited capabilities it is understood 
and there you will have to learn on your own capabilities and call all your progresses into play in a court of law. Taking all these matters into consideration, you approach your mode of trial and by the time your investigating officer comes, most of the evidence is now up alive and kicking for you. A lawyer knows how much of evidence has been demolished, whether I've been demolished or whether the prosecution has been demolished. So you can go. Now, investigating officer is always very important. Now, how do you plan the cross of an I.O.? Very important. So you can't put a detective on an I.O. But what you can do certainly is sometimes examine the court records. In court records, sometimes you also find case diaries. Examine those case diaries if they are available to you. Sometimes, you know, have an interaction with somebody in amongst the police officers and police station. My experience has taught me that in 90% of police prosecutions, the police never work their paperwork on the spot and you're able to catch them. But how will you catch them? You go back to your formula one, which is that you have done a crime scene visit. You have taken the measurements, you have taken the pictures and there you go. So the IO will present the case. He will present the evidence and you will cross examine him. Finally, you will give your suggestions that you did a flawed investigation or you did predetermined conclusions or you did not collect this piece of evidence directly or you over exaggerated this piece of evidence. Let me relate an IO's cross examine examination to a practical reality. Let me take you gentlemen and ladies back to Arushi Talwar. So I have a fantastic IO who says, sir, that according to me, these murders have happened in uh, X and Y and mechanism. So the details he gave as if he was an eyewitness account holder. So I wanted to basically break his illusion and blast his bubble. So I said that, uh, so you are so meticulous. You have given an account, which is almost as if you hold an eyewitness account. But can you tell me that according to you, these neck slits are with what kind of a weapon? He says, sir, according to me, these are medical and surgical scalpels. Well, I said, so thank you very much. You're saying that this is the work, the work of a surgical scalpel. Very good. So when you interrogated the accused, did you know that both of them are dentists? Yes, sir. Of course, I know that they're dentists. So did you ask them to present the dental scalpels, which are usually in the dental tray of a dentist? We well, said, sorry, I, I didn't do it. I said, can you tell the court why? Well, he said, I didn't deem it necessary. I said, do you know that a dental scalpel, which is ordinarily used by 99% dentists, has a cutting edge of only seven millimeters. And when you have a neck slit where half of the neck is chopped, in a single clean cut, you cannot use the dental scalpel at all because such kind of a scalpel will give you a jagged cut. So the investigating officer was shaking in his knees. On one hand, he had built, brought up an illusion. On the other hand, he had not done his basics. If his case was, there are two weapons. One is a golf club. One is a surgical scalpel. Then he needed to have collected both. Additionally, I had an additional tool. You never know in a case that you study, something may come in the record. So this IO in Arushi Talbar goes to Maulana Azad Medical College at Delhi and records the statement of one doctor who teaches dental surgery. So I have a statement and that surgeon says that the Length of the surgical scalpel used by a dentist is only seven millimeters. Now, there you go. So I ask a question to the IO that, sir, did you record this statement of one doctor called Dr. Chandra Bhushan Singh, who teaches dental surgery in Mansi at uh, New Delhi? He said, I've forgotten. Well, I said, you have your case diary. I also have the records. Don't try to be extra smart. Look in your case diary. So the judge says, Yeah, but you have a case diary. They clear, but I'm like, I go back on a little car. Did you use your little car? The both a cheap at the ra bayan for a kid that's up to surround it. Bayan for Liag to manaka be he bat sahi hai ki apne unko puchata ki dental scalpel ki kya link to the hai to une bataya ke sab cartane ka dan cable sat millimeter kauta. Kerahaji to bat up nebutai. 
मैं कहा देखिए आयो साहब क्योंकि उन्होंने आपको ये बात बताई कि काटरे का दांत केवल सात मिलीमीटर का है इसीलिए डॉक्टर राजेश तलवार से आपने उसकी डेंटल स्केल पर कभी नहीं मांगी क्योंकि आपको ये पता था कि साहब इफ यू आस्क फॉर अ डेंटल स्केल यू विल हैव टू सेंड इट फॉर अ फ्रेंसिक ओपिनियन एंड यू वुड हैव गॉट एन ओपिनियन विच वुड बी इन द नेगेटिव दैट्स वाई यू कैप दिस एस्पेक्ट डार्क and you trumped up the case against my client there you go in the trial court i met no success in the high court the strongest ever strictures passed against the cbi in independent india is in this very case so the trial court who convicted my clients was called by the division bench as some kind of a film director sometimes the division bench called him as a weird mathematician who was trying to solve an impossible puzzle but the importance lays in what i asked what was the purpose of the asking and how i intended and built up to demolish the prosecution witnesses so much has been talked so i would say to conclude this session each witness to be prepared individually don't get bogged down when virat kohli goes down to bat seeking to chase 350 He goes over by over. अगर वो पहले ही बोलेगा जी साढ़े तीन सौ तो मैं दो ही ओवर में बनाऊंगा तो अगली में विकेट ही बाहर निकल जाए सो यू हैव टू प्रेजेंट एंड प्रिपेयर योर केस विटनेस बाई विटनेस डोंट गेट बॉक डाउन बाई द मैग्निट्यूड ऑफ द ट्रायल और दी अटेंशन और वॉट मीडिया इज से मीडिया कभी भी केस डिसाइड नहीं करता मीडिया कैन डू इट यू नो रोटी मेकिंग ऑल राइट द मीडिया हैज टू अर्न अलॉट मनी नो प्रॉब्लम they'll make money in your misery they'll make money in your happiness the court of law will finally decide your case on the basis of in a criminal trial and a murder trial there will be only two things number one is examination in chief cross examination forensic evidence led in chief cross examination defense evidence chief and cross examination one important aspect is your statement under 313 because once prosecution evidence is over the judge will ask all the questions based on evidence to you that is not a stage to for any kind of complacency to set in each answer has to be made very very particularly some judges ask the questions directly to the clients and mostly clients flounder so you need to prepare your clients sometimes they are given in a questionnaire to us so we fill them up sometimes they are directly asked to the question if the answer goes wrong your whole work will come to an end so prepare your client thoroughly for 313 remember one thing your defense has to be there consistently right from the word go when you argued on charge it is the defense when you cross examined each witness you gave the same suggestions when you wrote your answers and the last important question in 313 which i must emphasize is earlier when i used to say there is to be a last question why this case against you and do you have anything else to say so most of the lawyers would say ke saab likh lo i have been falsely implicated thank you isse alawa aage aage kuch likhne ki zarurat nahi no 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 not now 313 is a salutary provision so every murder trial lawyer is under his obligation to give a detailed statement under 313 last question why is this case against him and why is he innocent lest you don't do that the judge doesn't know what kind of an explanation you are giving because tomorrow an accused can be a competent witness but sometimes you decide that my client is not you know a uh, that a confident fellow so that i can put him in the box maybe he will get rogered and he will go into the cleaner for full day like when i defended kuldeep singh singh in recently in unnao rape case though let me tell you gentlemen it's my belief that he has not even seen the girl yet he is got convicted for the life that but i was reluctant to put him in the box because the girl was giving an allegation because i thought that he's a weak fellow he may murder his case the case which i have otherwise won on evidence may get murdered in his cross examination so in all cases you will not get the accused to testify as competent witnesses but you will give a detailed statement under 313 enlisting the reasons 
why he is innocent and why he should be acquitted. Then you decide, depending upon what is the quantum of prosecution evidence, whether defense evidence is necessary or not. Sometimes it may be necessary. Sometimes it will not be necessary. Where it will be necessary, important. If it's expert evidence, then expert in defense. If it's a factual narrative, then some factual narrative to the contrary. For example, if you have an alibi. Now, alibi is something you have the, the accused takes the alibi directly. The prosecution doesn't have to prove your alibi. If the prosecution says that you were in Delhi at an X point of time, you say, sorry, sir, I was in Bombay, then the alibi burden is on accused and accused alone. So those witnesses have to come. They have to be trained. You have to train them before into they go to the court of law so that they don't, you know, tomorrow go give bloopers and demolish your case in the trial. Remember these things, friends, most important in your free time. I would recommend you read Veera Padala Reddy, Circumstantial Bible. Read Tessildar Singh. Read Judgments on Section 8 of Indian Evidence Act. Read Judgments on Section 9. Read Judgments on 45. Sometimes the law says uh, expert testimony is not binding on a court. Sorry, not now anymore. A DNA evidence is so crucial that it can never, no court can say that I will not call upon DNA evidence at all. So therefore, expert testimony, each and every aspect, what you must do is collate all these judgments and have them in your computers. In your free time, you can read them. All criminal cases will come their own myriad factual narratives, but issues will always be same. In a case of murder, murder is a fact. Correct? There is a case of culpable homicide of first degree. The judges know it, the lawyers know it. Sometimes you say that the murder has been committed in an X manner, and that's a fact. The question always is, who did it? And that's a question that you have to answer. If you go to the court with enough material at the stage of final argument that, sir, the prosecution case that I did it does not stand proved, you're out. And there goes your client. If other words, there is always, let me tell you, never lose heart when your client gets convicted because appeal is continuity of trial. And thank God, in appeal, what happens is that the trial court judgment is kept in the drawer. I have a drawer. I'll keep it in the drawer. The appellate court is not supposed to look at the trial court judgment at all in the first appeal. What does the appellate court do? Appellate court says, start from PW1. We want to go into evidence each witness again. So appellate court in a murder trial, that is a division bench in any court, in any high court in India, will reappreciate the evidence. Sometimes they may give you an opportunity even to record more evidence, but not on a daily basis. So they will go through the whole evidence and they'll come to a conclusion that whether this evidence is good for a conviction or bad for a conviction. That's the way you go about it. A, be prepared, use your time, let's read the judgments, let's compile them, and uh, uh, ultimately be prepared with your chart sheets, do your site visits, take pictures, take notes, take the help of experts, wherever the client is capable, and there you go. I'm sure that there will be many cases, you know, where you will earn acquittals, and some of those acquittals, you know, will also catapult you somewhere very high as high reckoned lawyers, so that's not the first objective. The objective is to face a challenge. And lastly, friends, I must tell you that never be undermined by the magnitude of the case. A good, strong trial lawyer never refuses a brief. So the more bad the brief is, if tomorrow you have a case which is very bad, it's a conviction written on the wall. You should be the first person to take that case. Take a chance. Never run away from a challenge in your life because it's the challenge which, you, which gives you the insulin shot. It gives you the adrenaline. It's a challenge that a person has to live up to. Believe in the innocence of your client. Do things fairly. Do things properly. Do things reasonably. Let's not resort to any kind of unethical activities, but do things fairly. So never refuse a brief just because you think that there is a written conviction. Be prepared to take 
a bad case, worst case, and go into the trial with complete confidence. Do your bit. Let me tell you, there are cases where even the losing lawyer gets a lot of fame, and that fame will be yours always and ever. And it's very important that you share your knowledge. So today on this platform, my idea was that with all you younger colleagues, I must share what I have learned for last twenty years. After all, I also have learned, you know, from my elders. So it's a duty upon me to give back to the fraternity what I have learned from the fraternity. Thank you very much, Ruchika. Thank you, my friends. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. I would be wonderful. more than willing to answer any kinds of questions that you have come your way regarding the present issue or any other issues that my younger friends would be wanting to know more about. We have almost hundred questions. Um, very well. <laughs> Let's so, go one by one. The first question uh, is from Abhinandan. He right. says, uh, "I want to know about criminal law firms in India. I am doing LLM in criminal law. So, apart from practice, whether I can join any law firm which is having expertise area in criminal law." All right, Abhinandan is an LLM student, right? Yes. And he is working for an LLM, and he wants to join a law firm which handles criminal practice, right? Yes. So, Abhinandan, thank you very much for your question, my young friend. I am also an LLM, and let me tell you, I have an LLM in intellectual property law, but I am a criminal trial lawyer. So it's never late. It depends upon your personal zest. Yes, there are a number of law firms, uh, you know, where there are partners and lawyers who are doing uh, dedicated criminal practice. But uh, yes, it, it all depends upon what kind of criminal practice you want to do, because a lot of lawyers want to do white collar crimes. and they want to do uh, cases related to money laundering uh, cbi trials prosecutions corruptions well uh, any of the law firms you know a lot of law firms have their you know uh, uh, their kind of work on their websites but uh, the uh, important aspect is that any person who wants to i i said in my speech also that any person who wants to be a litigator whether you want to do uh, you know uh, uh, dispute resolution uh, in criminal or civil law you must be deaf first in trial practice so i recommend that any person for example you know somebody wants to do a tribunal practice he may not necessarily go through the rigor mortis of trial law but if you want to do litigation you want to do arbitration you must spend 5 to 6 years dedicated in the trial courts wherever you want to go is your way sometimes law firms take you to trial courts sometimes individual lawyers take you to trial courts but let me tell you a trial lawyer you know who at the beginning of his career may be earning very less money compared to a person who works with amarchand mangaldas but let me tell you 15 years down the line the trial lawyer will be earning money 500 times more than so i i i i i believe that uh, uh, my your query is answered and you will pursue your dreams accordingly abhinandan thank you very much seven so uh, yes the video will be available it's already live on youtube so you can always check there's another question from ashish he says uh, what is the difference between murder culpable homicide not amounting to murder <laughs> well it's very simple if i take a gun and fire it in a crowd i don't know who will die i don't have an intention to kill anybody but i know that the my act is so reckless i have the knowledge that i will end up killing somebody that's culpable homicide not amounting to murder and murder is that when i know that i will stab you i will shoot you i will throttle you and you will die that's the fundamental difference this is a very very classic case a classic example you take a gun don't have a gun let me tell you Use an example that A fires a gun in a crowd of people, ending up killing one Z. Its case, it's called as culpable homicide, not amounting to murder in England and in America. It's also called as manslaughter. That's the difference, my friend. I hope your question and query is sufficed. One, um, Jayesh has a question. He says, "Sir, what would you suggest a junior lawyer?" 
at an early stage whether to opt for a particular stream of practice and stick to it or explore everything that comes their way all right younger lawyer very friend very important younger lawyer i'll say that a it all depends upon what kind of fire is burning inside your stomach if you say that sir i want to be a dedicated trial lawyer and i'll practice criminal law well then there's no backing out with me there is i believe in a simple philosophy not a step back not a step back so yes it depends upon what you want to do but if you want to take things as it is i'll say at the younger level you know do a bit of trial law do a bit of civil trial law i want my younger lawyers who are in litigators to get an experience in you know cross examinations dekhiye ek vakeel aur vakeel mein kya fark hota trial lawyer a litigating lawyer can advise a client anywhere in the world let me tell you people who don't do trial law with all respect to them and this is no offense most of them a lot of people practicing in supreme court have never done trial law but their advice to a client will always be half baked it's not that they are incompetent sometimes it is at you know at the border lines of quackery if you can call it. so have an experience in trial law dekhiye jis vakeel ne gawah se sawal aur jawab nahi kiya jis vakeel ne adalat mein gawah pesh nahi kiya jis vakeel ne muqaddame ki strategy nahi banayi wo kya vakeel hai so therefore i can understand that there are dedicated practice streams my advice for litigating lawyers is at the beginning have a strong trial court exposure that will equip you with how to handle evidence how to interpret evidence how to break evidence and then you can you know argue things with the plot so in the beginning if you want to do exclusive trial law go for it but if you have a chance to look at other things as well more than welcome and then you know when you start you know getting some kind of work in a particular stream or you can say thank you very much this is the kind of work i want to do i hope my answer suffices your query jayesh thank you very much um next is uh, from koshika she says in some murder case the offense under 302 is converted under 304 Yes. part 1 of ipc what yes. are the grounds of such conversion oh yes you know uh, normally you know you undergo a murder trial by the time you know the judge says that look here i feel that you know this offense was not intentional on part of the accused and he converts your case of murder and you know gives you a 10 year for culpable homicide not amounting to murder now let's use an example there is a two two man two two man man between two persons and one person uh, you know has a knife so he stabs another man and he gets an injury in his stomach his intestine intestines are ripped off the man is immediately goes to a hospital he is hospitalized the doctor does the patching and stitching work then five days down the line he goes into coma he has some kind of illness there is sepsis and the man dies now the accused is charged for murder now you as a cross examining lawyer will try your best to say that sir uh, i was not there this is the not the knife this is not the injury i didn't do it judge says sorry you did it but i feel that this one blow was not good enough it was not intentional you did it on the heat of the moment so i am taking you out to 302 and giving you a 304 part 1 or part 2 thank you koshika i i hope that your uh, question is properly answered thank you sir moving on to the next one um i don't know what's the name because it says home ipad and the question says the book titled arushi by aviruk sen yes gives a day to day account on the entire arushi arushi hemraj murder case yes the book sums up that parents are not guilty and yes. there was lapse of justice what's yes. your outlook on the book well i i i i uh, you know uh, aviruk sen was uh, covering the uh, aviruk sen is a freelance journalist he was covering arushi talwar hemraj double murders much before i went to do the trial in ghaziabad for the talwar dentist couple so he had his own perspective about the investigation
he had studied the papers and he was there in the trial every day with me so to a very large extent you know his style of narration uh, is uh, uh, very impressive but uh, he, he has his own conclusions and he uh, found from the evidence that the cbi case uh, in the trial court was uh, all but an illusion and uh, since there was such a huge media implosion and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, probably uh, i uh, believe my clients also ran into a very very strong conviction minded judge uh, leading to a conviction in the trial court and leading to complete exoneration in the high court you know arushi talwar a double murder acquittal from alabad high court is not an acquittal on benefit of doubt it's a case of complete exoneration because you don't pass strictures against the investigating agency in your appellate judgment saying that they tampered with evidence to implicate the dentist couple falsely you don't pass strictures against the trial judge and uh, still you know have a case of benefit of doubt so aviruk uh, wrote a fantastic book i've read his book and uh, uh, i've been in touch with him many time and uh, i think what he says in the book is largely very true but if you have seen that film called talwar that i will say is 95% fact 5% conviction um, uh, you know um, uh, but uh, uh, aviruk sen book is 100% fact thank you all for joseph can i have the next question so uh, how did discharge burden under section 106 indian evidence act any judgments oh, all right who asked this question uh katyani if uh, i'm katyani. pronouncing her, i'm pronouncing her name correctly all right so yeah. but, uh, so she's a lawyer or a law yes. student she's I a lawyer not sure all right no issue so 106 very special burden lawyer she says lawyer she says lawyer very good so 106 is you know the the language as it says is in criminal defense or civil defense civil trial criminal trial there is something called as basic theory of burdens and one must read it you know read read judgments on burden lots of law enunciated all over the world so uh, the fundamental postulate is he who asserts authenticates so if the prosecution says you are guilty the burden is on the prosecution but there's something called as statutory reverse burden as well 106 is a form of statutory reverse burden which means that if there is a special fact in my knowledge the burden to prove that fact is on me now let me give you an example katiani if i get the, get your name right if say my watch is found on a crime scene the burden will be on me to prove it you will call for that burden as a complainant counsel or as a prosecutor on the accused and accused alone after all if my watch is on the crime scene and the watch belongs to me then i'll have to give an explanation to the court that these are the circumstances your honor in which my watch has landed on a crime scene that's a special burden but sometimes a special burden is misconceived let's go to arushi talwar in arushi talwar prosecution says sir these people were inside the apartment so the burden is on them to say how the murders are committed sorry that's not 1106 says 106 says special fact uh, special knowledge of a particular fact is to be proved by the person who has that special knowledge so in arushi talwar the 106 was not pressed into the wrongly believed by various lawyers writers talkers media wala social media and all that thing google uh, somebody told me that arushi talwar is top 10 google world so many people cases i don't bother about that so the 106 burden in arushi talwar was not on the fact that these are inhabitants the 10 fact 106 fact was on the internet router activity because once i say i am asleep but the internet router activity says that uh, uh, that you know there is a continuous activity then i have to explain why is this continuous activity that you know can be called into play that and i'll give you a celebrated judgment on 106 katiyani you must read shambhu nath mishra 
versus State of Ajmer, that is 1956 Supreme Court. It's supposed to be a, just like Tashildar is a Bible on contradiction, Shambhunath Mehra is a Bible on 106. If you contemplate 106 in Shambhunath Mehra, you will break the teeth of prosecutors in the court who argue to the contrary. Not in the literal sense. All right, next question. Abhinav uh, Mittal says, Abhinav Mittal, yes. Yeah. So you are inspirational. Listening to you energized me today. Oh, very how, well, thank you. <laughs> how can I get internship with you, sir? Are you open? Okay. All right, yeah. wonderful. Abhinav, thank you very much for your uh, uh, commending words. Uh, let me tell you that, as I said, that, uh, you know, I'm 21 years uh, into practice. I still have fire burning in my stomach. And that's what you do need to do have my friend in legal practices. Don't depend on windfalls. Don't depend on gods. Don't depend on connections. Depend on your own ability. So if you want to intern with Lex Alliance, go to the site of Lex Alliance. Write an application. You will get a chance. Thank you, Abhinav. Next question. I'm going to unmute a few participants. They've raised the hand. Shweta, I'm unmuting you. You could ask your question directly. All right, Shweta. All right, Shweta. Hi, sir. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I am a PhD student at the University of Leicester in the UK. Oh, wonderful. Uh, my, wonderful. Research, uh, my research, thank you, sir. My research is based on uh, trial procedures for persons of unsound mind. And uh, basically, fitness to stand trial under Section 328, 329 of the CRPC. All right. Okay. So I want to know if you have ever dealt with a case where yes. the accused yes. was of unsound mind at the time of trial. And if so, was a trial of facts ever conducted? And what was your general experience in this case? Oh, <laughs> uh, if you uh, can, if you can uh, so that there is not an echo while I answer. So, okay. So are you able to hear me? Fine. Let me give you an answer. In 2015 and 16, I was engaged by government of Netherlands to defend a Dutch national by the name of Richard De Witt, who is accused of murdering a British girl called Sarah Victor Groves in a house board in Dull Lake in Kashmir. So after about three months of communication, I accepted the brief. Somebody flew down from Amsterdam to accompany me to the trial court in Sydney. That's a place where I come from, basically. So I found that my client at the beginning seemed to be at a person who, uh, you know, had some bipolar tendencies. And finally, in one day, he said in the court that, Your Honor, the water which is given in the jail is poisoned. And I want bottled water. So the judge said, why? He said, sir, this is a Pentagon conspiracy. So I said that I have had enough. So I filed an application that, sir, my client is not fit enough to face a trial. And he must be examined by psychiatrists to uh, determine whether he is fit enough to face the murder charge. Let me tell you, the girl had 58 stabs on her body. And this uh, murder case is covered daily by a British channel called ITV. If you ever go into Google, you can... Uh, Google Sarah Victor Groves murder trial, Kashmir, India. So the judge agreed. So I said, I, said, I want experts from uh, uh, Holland. The judge agreed. And I got two experts. They examined uh, Richard and uh, declared, uh, declared him to be totally loony. And uh, the judge then said that I would also like uh, this person to be examined by government psychiatrists appended to a government uh, hospital in Serenade. I said, please go ahead. So two psychiatrists came there also. And the person was just uh, declared, you know, unfit to face a trial. And that's exactly where I made an exit. I never followed the case again. So the legal mechanism is there. And if a person is declared unfit for a trial, he cannot face the trial at all. And that's true for India. That's true for England, anywhere in the world. I hope I answered your question, Shweta. And best of luck for your PhD. Shweta, thank you.
Thank you so much for your response, sir. I will look at this case. Yes. And fantastic yes. session. You are extremely inspirational. You're more than welcome. More than welcome. Can I have the next question, please? Shahbaz uh, Shah says, I met Deepak Talwar and Kuldeep Singh Sengar during recent visit to Tihar Jail. Oh, during... my, my, oh Deepak Talwar, all right. <laughs> yeah. Shahbaz, during... oh, so Shahbaz, give me that name again, Shahbaz. Shahbaz Shah. Shah, very good. Yeah. So you met both of my clients. What did they tell you? <laughs> Mr. Meer is a good lawyer or a bad lawyer? <laughs> I will uh, also unmute him. I'll read out the question. He All says, right. during, a que during a conversation with Deepak Talwar, he mentioned that the case took political turn, which aggravated things in the case. How do you think political influence on a case affects it? I'm a first year student from Campus Law Center. Okay, wonderful. If you have gone for a jail visit, let me tell you that you will your one day become a legendary lawyer. Because it shows that you have an inclination not to while your time, you know, uh, wandering around women's hostels, but doing some practical work. <laughs> Shabas have unmuted you. All right. Yeah, so, hello, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes. Yes, sir. So uh, during these visits, I met uh, both of them and I talked to them. So I got to know he had, I had a conversation for five to 10 minutes with Deepak well. Talwar. He's an excellent personality, like his aura and all. Uh, <laughs> So he mentioned this, he described his case and uh, what's going on in his case and he was helping the legal aids uh, clinic over there. Yes, he does. He yeah, does. So, so he mentioned this and it stuck, it got stuck in my mind, like how political uh, things influence the case. Yes. You see, uh, Shabazz, uh, it's a very, very touchy subject. But uh, let me tell you, political influence or otherwise should never affect the determination of the lawyer uh, to do his best. You should not be bogged down just because the politicians are after your client. You see, I am Deepak Talbar's lawyer for last more than four to five years. I know him very well. Deepak Talwar, you know, faces 32 federal prosecutions and he has been in custody from 31st of January 19. I have him bailed out out of 32 in 31. So uh, political influence is yes, because you see political influence means that you have the power in your hands, you have the power on the executive, you have the influence on the investigating authorities, and you are after somebody's skin. But at the end of the day, you know, ultimately, the investigating authorities do not have to win their cases in their offices. They have to win their cases in the courts. The Arushi Talwar murder case was to be won by the CBI, not in CBI office. They had to win it in the court. In the court, they didn't win it. I won it. So ultimately, when you stand in a court of law and you can hammer the other side and prove to the whole world that your client was castigated for nothing. The misfortune in India in comparison with Western democracies, you know, where there is a concept of strong, you know, uh, actual damages against the state, unfortunately, is absent here. Say, for example, in some states in United States, if you know somebody is prosecuted wrongly and the man gets acquitted, he has the right to sue back. You know, there is a very famous case coming out of England. It's a defamation case, which was you can read about it on the Internet. It is a defamation case lodged by the famous cricketer Ian Botham against now who is the president of Pakistan, Imran Khan. When Imran Khan wrote his autobiography, he said that Ian Botham was a racist cricketer. When the book hit the shelves, there came a libel and a, you know, a slandering suit. It was contested. So Imran and his newly wed wife, Jemima Goldsmith, used to go to England and contest the case. I, as a student, was not a lawyer then, but I used to follow the case very, very keenly. The case was lost by Ian Botham and Ellen Lamb. And let me tell you, they had to pay damages to 1.5 million pounds only for the legal costs of Imran Khan. That's a misfortune in Indian legal scenario that in a particular case, your client may remain in custody for four years, but there's nothing, you know, that can, he can't go back. And so it's very difficult proposition. Political influence is there. It is there in Deepak Talwar's case. I know it. He knows it. But what is there at the end of the day is my grit, his grit to fight it out 
and to fight it out till the last. And that's what I believe in. And I feel that, you know, you will also do it and imbibe these qualities all your life. Thank you, Shabazz. Keep up your good work of going to Tihar Jail and getting the first-hand experience of how things work in law on practical ground reality. I hope I have answered your query. Can I have the next question? A book uh, which every law student must read. It's Akash. I can't read the entire name because there are a lot of numbers. But yeah, Akash says, so what book could, could every lawyer read? Well, if you want to see it on the lighter sense, read the book called as Law is an Ass. Wow. Uh, could you mention who's the author? Oh, I, I forget, but it's up, up my rack. You will find it on the net anywhere. Well, read anything, you know, uh, read anything. You know, it, it's not sort of, you know, uh, let me tell you, the legal profession is very myriad. It's very large. It's an ocean. A lawyer, for example, I'm a trial lawyer. So I have to have expertise, not only in law. Sometimes I am a ballistic. Sometimes I am a DNA. Sometimes I am a voice expert. Sometimes I am an internet expert. So uh, you have to, uh, my friend, read everything depending upon what hits you. And that's the beauty of the profession. The beauty of legal profession is that it is not mundane. Every challenge is emphatic. You know, it's so inspiring. Every case gets a new challenge, gets a new set of persons, you know, gets you to see a different people in different circumstances. And that's, that's what you really relish. It's not like, you know, going to the office again and punching the same computer or like, for what, like, for example, a banker does. And that's a challenge. So my friend, there is a lot to read and a uh, lot not to read. It's all up to you and uh, read whatever you like. And most important is that, uh, a, you know, a, a lawyer, whether a trial lawyer or otherwise, cannot be an introvert. You have to be an extrovert. You have to meet people. You have to make friends. You have to come up to me. You have to come to my office, have a cup of tea. You have to take an initiative. Because uh, mostly, you know, for me, I don't have time, but you have to take the plunge. So you have to take the first step. Thank you, sir. Arjit here says that law is a, as, uh, is a book by Ronald I. Ring. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I heard it once. So, all right. Yeah. What's the yeah. Question? Not many more questions. Mohit uh, here says that. How to get permission to visit the crime scene where the site has been blocked by the authorities from the public access? Very easy, very easy, Mohit. Very easy, very easy. The crime scene is blocked only in the initial part of the investigation so that the crime scene is not mutilated or trampled upon. But, you know, our Indian police, you know, particularly uh, coming from various states, they are great criminal investigators. Say, for example, in Arushi Talwar, in Noida, in that apartment, even the buffaloes crimed, uh, you know, on the crime scene. So you could see the ability of the Noida cops. Everybody trampled upon and everybody did whatever they have to do. So a lawyer can also go down and visit. But, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, that is in a lighter way. And that's all over the net. Uh, hundreds of people on the crime scene, uh, you know, mutilating the crime scene. But you can definitely, if the crime scene is blocked, or if it is barricaded, but it can't be barricaded forever. So you can file an application with the magistrate and say that, sir, I am the defense lawyer. I have the right to go and visit the crime scene and I should be given an opportunity to do so. And you are the master of the trial and the every investigating officer works under your jurisdiction. And why not? So this is my question. I wanted yes. to ask you since the beginning. Um, yes. So when the client comes to you, what is the state of mind when, you know, the clients come and how do you deal with them? Because there's a lot of emotional turmoil and a lot of things that happen. Yes. How do you deal with that? Well, mostly the clients come up to me when they have, you know, sort of, you know, been rogered all over the place. So, uh, uh, you know, and uh, they see me as a last resort. But yes, uh, uh, you know, the client comes in a great emotional anxiety and he has a lot of pain around him and he has a hope and you know hope is a great thing it sees the invincible conquers the invincible and uh, therefore you know he instills his hope in you 
and he sees you uh, as uh, somebody who's god sent and uh, he seeks help from you so you have to take care of his emotional anxiety as well but you don't have to give him you know guarantees and you have to tell him that this will be done this will not be done you have to tell him that you will try your best but these are the mechanisms like for example in my uh, practice of 21 years i've never offered a guarantee to the client even when i know that the work will be done because that's not what we do all my see lawyers will not give guarantees uh, some other people will you know and but they are not lawyers so uh, yes you have to uh, give him a bit bit of a bit of a sucker on his emotional anxiety but you also have to show him the reality you know uh, somebody being indicted say for unlawful activities act uh, will not get bail for two and a half years you know and we know it very well somebody indicted for a murder will not get bail for three years four years or sometimes may not get a bail for the whole trial at all ultimately a trial lawyer what he does is that if three years down the line once the trial has begun the trial comes to an end you should be on the exit gate not on the inner gate of the jail okay. wow that's that's brilliant sir thank you so much all right uh, moving on uh Sheroy, um, I am unmuting you. You could ask your question. All right, give me uh, the name. Sheroy. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, hello. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, this is Sheroy Budhanwala. I'm a practicing advocate at the Bombay High Court. Wonderful, uh, sir. Sir, I just wanted to know, uh, you know, since you're in the criminal uh, uh, field, yes. uh, something that really fascinates uh, a person is this: a witness turning hostile. Somebody oh, yes. you bring. Yes. and that person somersaults on you during the course of the trial yes. how do you how do you handle a, a witness like that yes. do, uh, do you get him impeached uh, and if so could you enlighten us on how this impeachment would work uh, uh, sheroy uh, wonderful very good question you know for a defense counsel if the witness turns hostile or oh, there is a, you know a, a, a cake to cut because uh, you know if the witness will go hostile he will be a witness of the prosecution usually for a defense witness never goes hostile because a defense witness the lawyer always prepares but yes yeah. you know sometimes even a hostile witness is very dangerous for the defense counsel because say for a when does a witness goes hostile a witness who is formally fundamentally a prosecution witness turns turtle on his original recorded statement and now tends to side with the accused but sometimes the witnesses are buffoons sometimes even a hostile witness will give you know some admissions which will hurt you then you know you will be under an incumbent obligation to take that witness you know to cleaners you will have to cross examine hard because as a defense counsel it will be your obligation to see that every witness who comes from the prosecution goes empty handed so for a defense lawyer a hostile witness is good news but for a prosecutor it is very bad news but yes hostile witness if he goes hostile on a statement under 164 he is in for an indictment the judge can convict him so we have a judge called vinod kumar who is a sessions judge in delhi who passed the famous judgment in om prakash chotala's judges teacher scam case 10 years rigorous imprisonment all over the net the appeal was fought by ramjeet malani lost in supreme court dismissed on first date so that's a case where a hostile testimonies were no this judge vinod kumar in that case also gave a sentence to some witnesses who turned hostile on their 164 statements in the local language in delhi or you know as it has been a 164 statement is called as kalam band bayan so if you go hostile on a kalam band bayan the witness is in big trouble but sometimes you know our accused persons also tell us sir that this witness is under my control so we will see i said fine you know let's see what he says in the court sometimes you even get to coach him but that's how it is you know ultimately whether a witness for prosecution will testify in their favor or not we don't know now for example if you look at the sorabuddin sheikh encounter case it resulted in an acquittal and it is nothing less than a political conspiracy why because the cbi 
was prosecuting cops, big time cops. They had important witnesses. Strangely, in a case as huge as Sorabuddin Sheikh encounter case, none of the statements had statements under 164. So, ke behan pe to aap jab marzi tab badal do. But if a witness turns hostile on a 164, he's in for an indictment. One of the biggest reasons for Sorabuddin Sheikh encounter case to get acquitted is that strangely the investigating authorities, as Shabazz said, quote unquote, political influence in a case as high as that, where you have accused DG, you have an accused IPS of Sanghi and Pandian. IAS office, IPA, IPS officer, Rajasthan cadre, main accused, jail mein art saal raha, bari ho gaya. Gawa jo hai apne bayano pe palat gaye, lekin case ke vivechak ne, ya investigating authority ne, ahem gawaon ke bayan to kalam band kare hi ne. That's a very convenient way to say that, look, we will prosecute you, but we will also pave a way, a path for your acquittals. I hope I answered your question, Shreya. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank so, you. with a, uh, I say, a tangy mixture of certain things which are uh, legal reality these days. Okay. Um, Next question, please. This is again my question to you. Okay. Which was the first case that you handled and uh, how did you get that case? What is the first case I handled... Uh, uh, is called uh, uh, now. Uh, this is a case relating to POTA and uh, what was the earlier Prevention of Terrorism Act. And there was a very famous sharpshooter in Delhi, a top cop, who was an IO in Parliament attack. And he was later shot dead by some gunmen over property dispute in Gurgaon. His name is ACP Rajbir. And Rajbir was IO in Parliament attack. Rajbir was IO in Humayu Magbara shootout case. I used to defend some accused out of Humayun Magbara shootout case. And that case uh, was, you know, uh, referred to me by some persons who were indicted for a murder, who were uh, lodged in Tihar jail number four. I found that case fascinating to defend. And POTA detainees were very difficult to defend because the POTA law was very, uh, you know, strongly drafted. So a confession before a DCP was admissible in evidence. And therefore, the, uh, you know, how that confession under Section 34, if I correctly remember, uh, was smashed to smithereens, one has to go to Parliament attack and read that judgment for a famous discourse, both by High Court and Supreme Court, where those confessions were never believed. And they were, you know, induced by torture or otherwise. So Humayun's Magbara shootout case was three detail persons tried for terrorism and... Uh, Three uh, uh, believed to be picked up at one place, proved to be picked up from different places, and it resulted in a conviction which I never challenged, but all of them were innocent. So that was my first case, uh, uh, which uh, you know went through the barrel of the trial. It was uh, the trial judge was the then Sessions Judge S. N. Dingra, later a judge of the High Court, who's now retired. And I remember every aspect of that case. Uh, including a ghastly murder which came from where the accused were from Ghaziabad and they had abducted somebody from uh, Nizamuddin and murdered him somewhere in Alwar. I got about five accused acquitted in that case after about five years of trial. So those were the first two cases. They go back to 1999-2000. Uh, Next question, please. His name is Rajesh Ghosh. I'm unmuting him. All right, Rajesh. Yeah. What's your question? Rajesh, you are unmuted. Yeah. Uh, good. Sir, good evening. This is Rajesh Ghosh from Kolkata. Very well. Uh, sir, I must compliment you for uh, giving such an inspirational talk. And uh, I have only two questions for you, sir. Okay. Number one is, uh, how do you have such a good oratory skill, number one? Okay. And I would like to have... Uh, just a few words on the best case which you think you had made so far. <laughs> All right. Uh, regarding oratory skills, uh, I say, uh, uh, Rajesh, uh, uh, oratory skills, uh, sometimes, you know, uh, these are not sort of, you know, natural uh, to a person or, 
you know, but you don't get them from the womb of your mother, if you can use a crass example, but you get developed. So it depends upon, you know, but, uh, so one has to, uh, you know, uh, have a gift of gab, you can develop it, you know, uh, have a lot reading, you know, uh, do public speaking, you know, do some uh, uh, read, uh, read about things on internet. And, uh, you know, one is that uh, you're able to uh, also, uh, you know, talk extempore about things once you have uh, confidence in the subject that you talk. Secondly, one is also to augment his vocabulary skills. So for that, there are, you know, a lot of technical elements. There are, you know, uh, there are books that there something we can read. And uh, that's all about developing oratory skills. It all comes from your natural confidence the comfort, the field, and also your liber your own uh, ability to deliver on the subject. Second, one of the, all right, are you saying one of the most uh, uh, fascinating cases I have fought till date uh, as a lawyer is not Arushi Talwar. It's a case, it is reported judgment. It's a case called Kali Ram uh, versus state of NCT Delhi decided by a BB in Delhi High Court where I appeared for uh, accused who were uh, convicted for uh, murdering four people. So uh, th this was a case for three indictments for murder. One for, uh, they shot four persons. So one lived, three died. So there was three counts of murder, one count of attempt, and the trial judge gave three counts of murder and one count of attempt to four people. I happened to argue that appeal and it was argued before uh, just retired Honorable Justice Pradeep Nandrajok uh, of the, uh, the Chief Justice of Bombay High Court who just retired and uh, in my uh, understanding was the most deserving judge to go to the Supreme Court but deliberately not taken. So uh, I argued the case before him for about seven continuous days and uh, that's a reported judgment where all the accused were acquitted I hold that case very, very close to me, but I didn't do the trial. But I think that I did a fascinating work in the appeal in exploiting the evidence which had been recorded. So uh, Arushi Talwar till now, you know, is one of the most talked about cases, but the case which is very close to me is Kalida. You can fi find it out on SEC online. You can find it out on Delhi reported judgments as well as AIR. Thank you, Mr. Ghosh. Can I have the next question? Yes, sir. Just going ahead. Uh, so I'm unmuting Ashok Vardhan Purohit. Ashok Purohit. Very good. Ashok, yes. what's your question? Good evening, sir. It's been uh, lovely listening to uh, the vast experience you shared. I've uh, had the opportunity to work in London for oh, wonderful. years. And uh, I have uh, done some uh, trials over there as well. However, I've moved to India and I've been uh, conducting some trials over here. Now, oh, so the uh, issue that remains, I mean, question is like, uh, you have addressed some very specific points and uh, there is a statement, especially going to the case of Tessildar, going to the yes. heart of it. Yes. Many yes. times I've seen that there are these uh, cases of POXO, whereas some of the statements are made by the uh, victim uh, mm. or the prosecutrix, as it's mm. rightfully said. Mm. And uh, the statements vary when mm. the statement is made before a magistrate where a statement is made before uh, the police officers along mm. with uh, their parent mm. uh, or guardian and when mm. they come in they are actually deposing before the court. So yes. is that omission brought about with the contradiction of the statements from uh, the statement before the magistrate or from the statement before the uh, police? All right. Ashoka, uh, very, very important question. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate you that you have practiced in England and you have exposure of two different continents under your belt already. I'm sure that you will do very well in your life. Thank yes, you, you know, uh, Tessildar remains the Bible. Tessildar is borrowed from common law concept. It comes from British law adopted in India. And, uh, you know, I recently did Kuldeep Singh Sengar uh, and it's a POXO indictment. Yes. And uh, I've done a number of uh, strong POXO cases. So, uh, you know, the POXO is a special legislation and the courts in POXO cases, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, go with an attitude uh, 
of being very, very friendly to the uh, victim. Uh, not, we should say that we are biased, but they ha- the victim always has an edge in a trial court. Absolutely. But at the same time, you know, both the statement recorded by the police officer under 161, which is an unsigned statement, and a 164 statement, which is a signed statement before a judicial magistrate, you know, both are not substantive pieces of evidence. And both of us will agree on that. And these are, uh, you know, statements which can only be used for confrontation or corroboration, as the case may be. So, uh, Poxo doesn't take anything away from Tesselda. Poxo also does not take anything away from the fundamental postulate that it is the prosecution which has to prove the case against the accused. But Poxo has two deadly uh, statutory burdens. One is a burden on the accused that once the, the allegation is made, the burden to disprove the case shall entirely bomb be on the accused. And second is you will prove this burden beyond reasonable doubt. Now, the second uh, burden is there also in NDPS Act, and it is also in the Black Money Act. Now, normally the law all over the world is that if a burden statutorily is put on an accused, he is to discharge that burden only on preponderance of probabilities. So preponderance of probability means to prove a civil case before a civil judge. Yes. And But in these statutory indictments, in these enactments, the burden on the accused is to prove his innocence beyond reasonable doubt. It's a very huge burden to discharge. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, you know, if the the witness makes a contradiction with a police statement or a magisterial statement, and in the estimation of the court, that contradiction, quote unquote, confrontation, quote unquote, goes to the root of the matter, then that part of the testimony has to be expunged from judicial consideration. And that's the law. So POXO has not demolished, it has not taken away the basic fundamental criminal postulate covenanted under section 162, read with 145, 162 CRPC, read with 145 of the Indian Evidence Act. But yes, Poxo is strong reverse burden legislation. The legislature has enacted it. Supreme Court has upheld it. It is not ultra virus, the constitution of India. And therefore, a, a, a Poxo, Poxo uh, accused detinue has a huge burden on his shoulders. And it's always a difficult case. Right, sir. So uh, I'll just continue my question if, if uh, with your uh, permission. Uh, Where? Like you have uh, bought some of the expert witnesses. Uh, from overseas many a times and uh, yes. they you utilize the skill sets yes. in uh, strongly putting forward a very pragmatic case bef- uh, before the court. Yes. So when you can make such cogent presentations, the fact of the matter remains that at what stage do you bring external evidence on record before the trial court or any details with regards to the expert evidence which has to be brought before the trial court because where it has been seen in many of the cases that you have done uh, yes. and which you have narrated as well, that yes. uh, you have bought the skill sets and you've been able to successfully demonstrate to the Correct. court that yes. you have to take a very learned view before you yes. come to an objective reasoning and come to a final conclusion of the matter. But at what stage should we bring this evidence and how do we uh, move that application at what stage? Sir? So can you just shed some light on it? I think that'll, yes. that'll really bring the entire uh, point home. Sir. Yes. Uh, That's a very incisive question, uh, Ashok. And uh, let me tell you that uh, on a normal platform, this uh, gets into a very specialized skill of sex. But I will, uh, you know, be more than uh, willing to share uh, my specialized skill skill sets on this. So first of all is that, you know, for example, uh, somebody is wanting to, prosecution is wanting to lead DNA evidence. So, uh, you know, uh, now, in England, you know, the, the rule of fair disclosure of entire evidence, and I, and I hope that, you know, uh, I'm, uh, the, my other friends who are still on uh, the link are able to understand it, is uh, very fundamental to criminal prosecution. In England, we are governed by something which is called as Attorney General's Guidelines on Fair Disclosure, which means that if the prosecution or the, uh, the Crown, uh, you know, uh, wants to produce expert evidence, 
they have to supply all databases, all results, all methodologies, everything to the defense upfront. The landmark judgment uh, on this regard from England is a famous 1997 All England Reports, page 369. It's called as R versus Gary Adams and R versus Alan Doheny, D O H E N Y. It's a sexual assault double whammy and on DNA. And the, the House of Lords in that judgment said that, look here, if you are relying upon DNA, you give your databases, you give your calculations, you give your electropharograms, you share with your worksheets as well, upprint with the defense council. This is what happens in England. Right, in so India, you will get nothing. You will only get the final chart. Wow. So there is a huge battle I have to fight and I have fought, just like I told you in Arushi Talwar, the first battle was to get the databases. Now, without the database, a defense DNA expert is as good as a cropper. If he does not have the DNA basis, if he does not have the databases, he will not be able to analyze the report. He will not be able to analyze the evidence and to give you a contrary opinion. So the first fight is on fair and full disclosure. For this, most of the time, whenever I am with CBI, you know, I am always at loggerheads because the CBI never gives you exculpatory evidence which they collected during the course of investigation. So you have to first fight it out almost every time up to the high court to get the position of exculpatory evidence or all scientific databases which the prosecution witnesses or experts will rely upon. Now what you do is, the moment you have these databases, you show them to your expert. So you need your expert right from the beginning. So your expert will analyze, he will give a report, you will have a discussion with him, and he will help you to prepare a questionnaire. Now with that questionnaire, you will go and you will seek to demolish the prosecution witness. Let me give you an example. I'm, I was doing a case of dowry debt for uh, accused who are very well to do, uh, and you know, uh, big marriage, uh, Bollywood actresses dancing in the marriage. And uh, after three years, the daughter-in-law jumping from the rooftop. So uh, the family uh, is indicted for dowry debt. And uh, there is a forensic expert who says that there are 16 injuries. He's a MD in forensic science from All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He has a big report. He has his analysis and he's a very, very strong man in his own field. So I go to an expert, show the report, show his basis. And an expert, you know, says that this guy is a fool. And uh, he helps me to prepare a cross-examination. By the time my cross-examination is over, the answer which this MD in forensics in Ames gave before the court, I asked him that uh, Dr. Saab, can you rule out assault as a cause for all the 16 injuries that you have referred to in your postmortem report? He said, sir, I cannot rule out. That's the achievement. And that can only be possible in two ways. Either you have your expert right from the beginning. He works with you. But don't forget, don't commit the mistake of famous Pandit R.K. Naseem. You need your expert in defense as well because ultimately it's a diamond who cuts a diamond. I hope I answered your query, Ashok, and uh, uh, you must give me a call and have a cup of tea with me anytime. Certainly. So I do come down to Delhi and I do visit the Supreme Court as well quite often. So uh, I think it'll be a pleasure, sir. We will certainly be connected. I'll get in touch. With Thank you very much. Have, have a nice have evening. evening. It's been an amazing session, sir. All the oh, way back. Wonderful. Very. Oh, where do you practice? Uh, sir, uh, what I do is I practice uh, across the globe. I've got a few clients in Canada, oh, in, Singapore, uh, uh, in London and in India. So in India, I'm pulled around. I've worked uh, fortunately on some of the you know, famous cases like Asharam Bapu where I was prosecuting. Hmm. And, uh, and uh, when people like Arun Gavli, Michael Ferreira, we've, we've worked on some really good matters and I've had some brilliant oh, I did go down to Bombay and argue Indrani Mukherjee's bail about four occasions. All right. So uh, not with the success at this time, but uh, uh, you know, uh, I look forward to meet you sometime. Certainly, have a nice evening. You as well, sir. You as well. Thank you very much. Next question, please.
So, um, would you like to continue with the webinar, or oh, uh, no, no, no. I'll answer some more questions though quickly, and then I will also, you know, give my email. So yeah. most of my friends can post their questions, you know, in the email, and I will always answer those. All right. Sir. So yeah. um, when I got disconnected, there were a few questions. Uh, I still have those, so I will continue with those. Yes. One of the students says, "I don't know what's the name, but it says am I phone." The question is, sir. Thank you for such an inspirational session. I have a question. Is there anything the complainant can do to ensure that police and prosecutor do their job well? Mm -hmm. Because if the prosecution is not diligent, the complainant should suffer if the case is genuine. Very good question. Uh, whoever is uh, the person, though you should not call yourself as MI phone. Though uh, yes, you know the complainants. You know, oftenly we see. You know, a others. You know, we are. third world countries most of the people are poor sometimes you know uh, they cannot afford lawyers to stand as complainant councils complainant councils though do not have a great locus in state prosecutions but they certainly have a locus and if you have a good complainant council he has the right of assistance to the prosecutor and he can also stand behind the prosecutor like you know a watchdog so that the prosecutor also does his job properly like in uh, you know uh, in this recent uh, kuldeep singh sanger's case uh, there was a, a complainant counsel uh, who did his work diligently though he was a menace to me because most of the time when i was doing my work he was trying to you know create circumstances where i get shattered here and there but i think you know he was hot on the heels of the prosecutors and he did this job as a complainant counsel very well complainant counsel always helps but then you know at he has to have his involvement in the case that's for everybody so uh, you should not shy away from taking a complaint in brief as well if it comes your way can i have the next question yes sir um the next question is uh from kabir dikshit he says dikshit. yeah from the prosecution or complainant side so if an accused is someone from say the judiciary or someone from the corridors of power hmm. is is there a sometimes in judiciary a hesitation to convict ho oh. fundamentally there should not be you know because ultimately uh, uh, you know uh, you have seen uh, huge people uh, in power and possession you know uh, you have seen uh, you know the, the former home ministers former uh, finance minister chidambaram going down you know getting arrested having to fight for his bail up to supreme court in the money laundering indictments yes if there is you see uh, the judges are also human beings and uh, uh, at the end of the day uh, a very uh, uh, some years ago uh, a, a chief justice sabarwal of supreme court said that we are not correct because we are right we are correct because we are the last in the line so uh, uh human beings everywhere where you know some influence will come into play we don't know whether influence is a part and part of our lives you can't have an ideal system all our life there can never be an ideal system till the man and the woman exists on this planet there will always be you know right things wrong there's good things bad things it's all in the society so yes uh you you look at sorabuddin sheikh and counter case you're able to see that the prosecutors and the investigating authorities definitely wanted to help the accused that is why none of the witness statements were recorded under 164 so you will have these situations but that's a situation you know where if somebody has a complaint and brief he can work wonderfully in uh, the riot cases of of gujarat emanating from 2002 there were lawyers who petitioned petition the supreme court that the cases are being slaughtered so the supreme court interfered they took the cases to bombay where accused finally were convicted they were also some great samaritans with complainant briefs so the complainant can say the sir that this piece of investigation is not being correctly investigated you can take a matter to a magistrate you can take a matter to high court it all depends upon where you are engaged what stage you are engaged and uh, how much of zest and fire you have in uh, tackling the situation and taking it to a logical conclusion 
Thank you. So the next question is, how do you, as a criminal lawyer, deal with ethics questions? Oh, you know, ethics questions, very simple, not very complicated. So it's all up to you. For example, I have very straight ethics with my clients. I always get a lot of clients who say, hey, sir, our police is a chakkar, please help us here. So I say, Babu, if you go to the police, then maybe you will have 50,000 rupees. If I call the police, then the police will have 5,000 rupees. So the monkey is off my shoulder. So very simple, your ethics are with you. You simply say to a client, So very simple, your ethics are with you. You simply say to a client who's wanting, you know, certain help there and there, that you're not a person for the job, you're not involved in this kind of practice, and you are a man of the merit and merit alone. And that's what you stick to. If you are a man of the merit, then, you know, at some day, you will be recognized in your career, you will be recognized in your profession. You may not have a big judicial background, you may not have a very legal background, but if you're strong, you know, you will, success will be there. It may be delayed. It can never be denied. Yeah. Ethics so very important. Sir. Maintain your ethics. How to get a witness comfortable to speak and point and find out loopholes without offending the witness? Oh, yes. It all depends upon, you know, you can see it in the witness's eyes, whether the man is shaking, whether he's a first timer in the court, whether he's a confident guy or whether he's a, a, a very, very, you know, he knows his field very well. So, uh, uh, you know, you're able to gather a witness in about first to four, five questions of your cross-examination. Then, you know, as a cross-examining lawyer, you are trained, you have your skill sets, you know what you from, want from the witness. Sometimes you get it, sometimes you don't get it. Ultimately, you do your job, finally give your suggestions so that even if the witness, you know, had a good day, you didn't have a that great day. But finally, there is consistency and you have a consistent stand. One witness may good go for the prosecution. The next witness may totally damage his case for entirety. Who knows? Thank you so much, sir, for answering all the questions. I'm sure uh, there are a lot more participants wanting to ask questions. Uh, could you share your email ID so that they could write it to you? And okay. Now, I think you have my email so you can put it on the platform or it's very simply lexalliance.tanveer at gmail.com. That is L-E-X, London, England, X-Mass, A-L-L, America, London, London, I-A-N-C-E dot Tanveer, my first name, that is T-A-N-V-E-R at gmail.com. Any of the questions from today's conversation, you can shoot to me, be assured that today or tomorrow I will answer all the questions I can understand. It's difficult on a platform to be there for two hours. I'm also feeling a bit tired now, but all my friends on this platform are free to give me a phone call, to write to me on email. If you are in Delhi, you can seek an appointment with me, come to my office, have a cup of tea with my office. You can meet me in the court. You can join me in some interesting work that I'm doing. I can, you know, take you to the court sometime along with me. And that's how we do it. So I would like to uh, uh, give my parting thoughts. So uh, thank you, Ruchika. Thank you. Thank Abhishek. you so much, sir, for so, uh, coming good over. Good luck to you with your lawseco.com. Thank you. And, uh, thank you so much, sir. all the participants. And uh, uh, it's always a story of I inspiring you uh, more than you inspiring me. I think I have uh, talked to some wonderful people today and some great interaction. I think I've also learned, and that's the attitude we have. We learn all our life, and what we learn, we pass it on to the incoming lawyers, and that's the way the legal profession is. It's not that on my skill sets, I don't have a trade trademark, I don't have a patent. Every lawyer is under an obligation to pass on to the next generation of lawyers what they learned from their elders. So thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Thanks so much, sir. Was, thank you so time. much for your precious time. It was it was the brilliant session. Thank you thank so thank you much. much. Thank you. I'll leave the meeting. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, feel free to drop your questions on the email sir has given you, and you could also reach out to us on LinkedIn or the WhatsApp groups. Thank you so much.